Okay, so now it's recording. Oh, sure. Why does it seem a little bit... Never mind. It's fine. It should be fine. I'm trying to find, you know, one of those little bubble le levers so that I can put it here, but uh, I haven't found one. Bubble what? Le uh, Bellies? Levels? I'm not sure how this, what it is. Uh, you know, one of those little things with a bubble inside so you can tell Oh yes, 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 yes. I know, I know. I forgot the name. Bubble, I think it, or is it bubble balance? One of those things. Okay. Okay, so, um, as mentioned before, uh, I'll just start the interview, but if there is something sensitive that you want to cut out, let me know or just cut it out. Okay. Right, and um, Im immediately after this interview is done, I go for my booster sound and I upload it. Un unless, you know, you tell me to cut off this part. Okay. Okay, so I guess let's start with your name. Mm -hmm. So, uh, my name is Pavel Hojnaski and I am known on the internet and in several hacker spaces as ALXD. Mm. This is basically a self-claimed name, one of the shortest on the internet that has something in common with Alexander. Right, right. Uh, and what I have web page alxd.org. Uh, I try putting all my all interesting pieces of my activism mm -hmm. and my projects there. Uh, but maybe maybe give me a specific question because stream of thought will be too broad for me. <laughs> sure, sure. I've got the questions. Mm -hmm. um, so, how old are you this year? Uh, yes, this year I'm 25. 25, okay. Mm -hmm. And um, could you tell me a little bit about your profession? Mm -hmm. So, right now, as I'm a web developer uh, full time and uh, freelancing for different companies uh, around the world. Uh, and this is something I like, I do, I am uh, i don't know if I should be proud of, I like uh, building neat things, but I know that I could use my skills in, in a lot of ways, uh, so for example I love computational neuroscience, uh, I am trying to carry on several projects with, uh, uh, with my skills, uh, however small they are, uh, but uh, this doesn't earn me any money and in our world it's very hard to actually make any money as a computational neuroscientist. Mm. Okay. And, um, so what are some personal projects that you are working on now? Mm -hmm. So right now I'm working on uh, Neuron Sleep Mask uh, this was actually uh, the biggest Polish uh, startup, uh, which claimed that uh, it allows people uh, to sleep uh, fewer ha fewer hours, uh, and uh, uh, it had uh, several very interesting sounding claims, mm -hmm. such as uh, using EEGs from only three electrodes placed uh, on the uh, on the eyebrows. Uh, and uh, gathering signal good enough to actually uh, measure sleep EEG and uh, gather sleep stages based on that. Uh, this sounded very unlikely to me because such a technology would be good enough to sell to Google or DARPA for several billion dollars, not to create a small startup around. Uh, and uh, since the since the conception of the of the startup, I was following it. I was criticizing it loudly, uh, and recently they actually uh, agreed to give me a, a test uh, uh, a test unit uh, they used for the uh, for debugging. So I rented a lab at local hospital, uh, gathered uh, some signal with both neuron and uh, a professional, professional polysomnograph and right now I am working to, uh, to just uh, analyze them uh, first to synchronize them uh, to say if the sleep stages are uh, similar enough that neuron can be deemed useful uh, and uh, when I have time and this will be very tedious 
if neural on can give any uh, specific uh, uh, information on sleep stages, even assuming that it was using different uh, sleep staging, uh, different algorithms uh, than it is using now. Uh, so I'm putting all my research, all my analysis online in open uh, notebook uh, format, uh, totally open access on my GitHub, so anybody can do it and, and anybody can analyze it with me, anybody can uh, create analysis on, uh, of their own. And I think that this should be the way science is done. And also just being skeptical about startups and about scientific claims uh, in the in the society is something that uh, scientists and citizen scientists should do. Mm. Okay. And how has it been um, trying to verify neuro on? Is that name? Mm -hmm. Yes. One's claims. Uh, it's actually it's hard. Uh, it's hard because uh, uh, trying to uh, trying to disprove something. Uh, it's very hard if you don't have very specific and narrow, uh, 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 narrow information. What what does it claim to do? And with neuron, we have very broad strokes about uh, some patterns I couldn't find, uh, some uh, uh, some algorithms uh, I am not allowed to share, uh, and. Uh, Basically, uh, it all that we know publicly is that it should record uh, sleep EEG, uh, and it should do something with this, with accelerometer, with uh, blood oxygenation rate, blood uh, satur blood oxygen sat saturation rate, and with uh, uh, heart rate, and actually uh, compute sleep stages based on that. Uh, which factor is the most important? I don't know. Uh, and uh, basically, I am trying to compare if it is similar to polysomnograph, to a professional. The, the, the best way we have of assessing somebody's sleep stages right now. Mm, okay. And previously, um, you were working on, or at least playing around with OpenBCI, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I understand. You, you survived brain cancer? Uh, yes, brain tumor, because in English, cancer and tumor is a little, sounds a little similar. So uh, it wasn't malicious. Uh, it was uh, just a tumor on, on my brain ver as a balloon vermis, so just by the fourth ventricle. Uh, and uh, I was diagnosed when I was uh, Nine years old, uh, I was given a surgery immediately after that one chemo, and uh, I survived. I didn't lose my eyesight. I didn't lose anything except of uh, my, my sense of balance and uh, uh, ability to write. But with rehabilitation and with uh, uh, several years of uh, neurotropics, I was able to uh, relearn how to walk, relearn how to. Uh, how to write, and basically I live I live normally right now. Uh, but this got me interested in neuroscience. Mm. So this happened when you were nine. Yes. And that sparked your interest in neuroscience. Um, how did you nurture this interest since mm -hmm. uh, since childhood? Since childhood, uh, it was very slow because. Uh, I don't know if it's a general for Polish schools, but we weren't exactly, uh, we weren't uh, being uh, taught that we can uh, learn things outside of the handbooks. And I didn't like the biology handbooks, it, they were quite awful. Uh, and uh, uh, firstly, I was interested in philosophy of the mind, uh, and I just kept to philosophy. Uh, then, uh, when I started my university courses, I managed to, uh, to apply and get accepted to computational neuroscience at the University of Warsaw. And uh, with all the trivia that I was gathering from throughout the years, uh, I was one of the students who was 
uh, the most aware of what is happening within Polish uh, neuroscience. And uh, I was actually able to uh, ask professors about their previous projects and sadly uh, to be uh, to be turned down by down by them because they weren't talking to some first grader about about anything until the first grader read their books. So it was quite sad for very enthusiastic. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe not geek, but I don't know if geek or nerd would be good, but very enthusiastic student wanting to learn about uh, Polish brain implants or uh, what is happening with, between Polish and German uh, brain, uh, uh, just brain science institutes. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, so you were born and raised in Warsaw? Uh, not Warsaw exactly, uh, but well, in a small town uh, just 30 kilometers away. So this is a part of the agglomeration, but uh, not the city itself. And this was quite small, calm town. Uh, I was spending a lot of time on the internet because I couldn't find uh, very, uh, very much interesting places uh, uh, around me in the town. Uh, so I got hooked in Ultima Online uh, and then I realized that I'm getting addicted so uh, I actually asked to, uh, asked to be banned from Ultima Online. Nobody wanted to give me a ban only because I was asking for them, for, for that. So I actually had to call mods and uh, just faggots and factors so they actually banned me then. <laughs> Yes, you know, first community hack uh, I, I learned. I don't know if uh, this is social engineering, but <laughs> but it was quite funny at the time. And I got into uh, GIMP graphic editing, then into Linux. Uh, then I got very interested in open source. Uh, I actually managed to get to a, a course which was intended for uh, uh, IT graduates uh, just to give them more background into Linux uh, uh, but the course was organized in this way I met a lot of people with no social skills and I was turned away from IT for several years so I was back to philosophy and trying to understand what mind is uh, trying to think what what do I want to do to to just uh, understand it better, uh, but after after going to uh, to uh, university and uh, uh, being a part of uh, 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 being majoring in, uh, in computational neuroscience, I learned that basically we can do a lot with the uh, computational tools we have now. So I was able to actually create a 200, year, uh, 200 lines Python script which was able to tell me what somebody is looking on based on that EEG. So this is huge, wow, and this should be shown to first year students just to, just to show them, hey, you are able to do a lot if you only learn those tools. So my passion for IT was reignited I learned a lot of Python despite of the university courses because the quality of uh, courses uh, outside of the uh, IT faculty is very low and I don't recommend them. Uh, and uh, uh, I managed to actually understand quite a lot. Uh, I was very ambitious. I wanted to, to take part in the grown up projects. Uh, with actually master students and PhD students, uh, I decided that I wanted to help in local uh, uh, building local framework because we had an uh, SSVEP uh, uh, and P100 framework, uh, basically EEG, which allowed uh, people in lock, uh, locked in state uh, to operate uh, computers using only uh, the brains and attention focus, just shifting the attention. We showed them a screen 
uh, with different keys blinking in different frequencies. And basically, the key that was uh, uh, that was uh, that they were focusing on uh, bl uh, was the frequency of the key was also present in the EEG after two or four seconds, mm -hmm. which was quite great. And uh, that this framework was open sourced. Our professor actually open sourced it for everybody. So I was absolutely enthusiastic about it. Uh, I uh, went to uh, Euro PyCon, uh, Euro, uh, sorry, Euro SciPy uh, 213 uh, to Brussels uh, and actually went looking for programmers who would like to help us, who would like to uh, take part in the framework building. Uh, I found uh, three programmers, uh, one of them uh, being a Polish-born uh, Ireland uh, guy uh, who, who worked in IT and had quite extensive experience with TDD. So I tried to connect them with the professor's team. And this was the biggest turn down in, in my life because professor said that he is not interested in open sourcing it as in working with open, so open source community because he has had a uh, bad experience with it. He doesn't want help of anybody outside, but they are welcome to, uh, to fork the project. The only problem was there was no, no documentation, no tests. Uh, the code was either spaghetti or looked obfuscated with uh, X, Y, Z uh, as uh, variable names. And uh, the project ran only on the professors and uh, PhD, uh, 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 PhD computers. So uh, there was no way of, uh, of running it anywhere else. And now, since, la since last year, there is no way of running uh, it as we intended to on tablets because Google actually claimed a patent on that kind of framework, so you cannot create any kind of uh, uh, pattern, uh, any kind of uh, uh, device with uh, uh, any kind of application running on a mobile device uh, to be used with your brainwaves without contacting Google. Wow. Yes, this is very broad. This is very broad. This actually uh, may be violating several patents of other European companies, but this is something that Google got and I don't want to meet them in court. In court. So uh, this was the part that, uh, that turned me away from the academia, from the university. I didn't complete my uh, uh, BSc course. Uh, I, I thought that I just don't want to uh, to continue for several years only to be allowed to be a part of the project officially, only to be turned down because somebody doesn't want to share the code because somebody wants to keep working on that. In my understanding, only taking money for something which won't benefit humanity in any way. Because we uh, at EuroSciPy, I learned that we have several uh, frameworks similar to that and several frameworks we could use like that uh, in, in different countries. We have open mini we had uh, not open CV, but there is very one very similar to open ME uh, uh, project in, in France. Uh, there is something in, in Russia and we don't collaborate. Our Polish team didn't want to collaborate with anybody and this was heartbreaking for me. Because I was, I was all the way for open source, for sharing knowledge, and for creating something for for humanity, using big words and uh, believing in big ideas, and the realism of academia like killed it all. So I decided I don't do, I don't want to be a part uh, of academia, and uh, I focused my attention uh, at also hacker space instead. Uh, I became a member, I think, several months before the whole Brussels conference uh, thing. And I started learning more and more on my own, uh, self-educating, firstly Python. I landed uh, a regular job at, uh, at backend in Python, then went full stack, 
uh, started doing different job uh, freelancing, so my skill, uh, my skill was growing. And uh, uh, and basically, I was working uh, in uh, I was working on several projects in hyperspace. Most of them were social projects, like uh, uh, getting new people interested in hackerspace, starting a bio lab, uh, creating more welcoming infrastructure, uh, helping people who actually needed uh, uh, something and we could help. For example, we were visited by one of the uh, European Parliament, uh, uh, maybe not employees, but uh, councillors. Uh, who was helping creating laws, uh, was very afraid that her uh, data on her uh, computer wasn't encrypted and every time she crossed the border to US or UK or several different countries, they could get a full backup uh, the, uh, of, of all the data even if she had, even if she had something very, uh, very sensitive. So she asked us to encrypt it, we helped her uh, with that and uh, somebody wanted to get help uh, 3D printing something because uh, universities in Poland don't want to work and collaborate with the students on the project. Even if you, if student is tasked with doing something which requires 3D printing, they will probably not get any access to a 3D printer. Because 3D printers are very expensive, they are put behind the log and only the university staff is able to get it in any kind of easy way. Uh, so uh, I, uh, by accident, uh, the framework that our professor created had the same name as, uh, as the startup, uh, open hardware startup from US. It, the name was OpenBCI. And I actually created a fork of the professor's project on GitHub. So uh, OpenBCI guys from US contacted me, uh, and we uh, we managed uh, to, uh, to just uh, uh, there was a very good connection between us. I loved what they are doing, creating basically uh, standard. Uh, uh, standard uh, amplifier for uh, open hardware and uh, open science projects. This is like Arduino for uh, for uh, uh, neuroscientists. Uh, and I gave them the GitHub domain. Uh, in exchange, we got an OpenBCI board as a hacker space, which was absolutely awesome. I started doing several experiments. Uh, the problem was I wasn't very skilled in uh, hardware and OpenBCI uh, as amplifier has uh, several uh, limitations. For example, it cannot uh, record uh, uh, with uh, uh, signal with frequencies uh, uh, higher than 250 uh, Hz uh, with eight channels and the 125 for 16 channels uh, as uh, uh, this is uh, basically the uh, maximum bandwidth bluetooth can uh, can handle and uh, due to us uh, health law uh, they cannot really use any kind of cable uh, between open bci to any kind of electric source uh, in order not to turn eeg uh, set up into electric chair. So uh, we started uh, looking into that in lots of hacker space. There was a very nice uh, idea that since OpenBCI has a, a SD card, if we uh, would be able to just uh, redirect all the signal on the SD card, but with, without any kind of uh, locking it, uh, uh, to uh, 250 hertz, this would be very interesting because actually getting uh, uh, getting sampling rate more than uh, 512 hertz uh, will be very interesting for several uh, kinds of uh, neural experiments. And I don't think that anybody outside uh, done that. We tried in Watson Hacker Space and got some quirky results because 
uh, different channels started uh, started desynchronizing, which was very very troublesome. And before I learn uh, much more uh, uh, much more hardware, I won't be able to, to program it myself. So uh, we will see. Okay. A uh, couple of things uh, to clarify before we move mm -hmm. on, which is, um, so you, s you spent your childhood in a, a, a kind of small town. Yes. Away from Warsaw or nearby. Mm -hmm. What's the name of the town? Wołomin. Uh, okay. And mm -hmm. when did you move to Warsaw? Uh, when I was 19, uh, when that was that was after I started studying uh, uh, new computational uh, neuroscience, actually, uh, because uh, for the first year I chose completely randomly just to get to any kind of university. I chose civil engineering, and this was a total disaster because I'm not interested in civil engineering and I couldn't really get people there. Then I chose philosophy, but after a year of philosophy and just driving uh, every day from Wyoming to Warsaw, uh, it's not that far, but it's more than an hour each way. Uh, after philosophy, I I just uh, I just thought philosophers have a lot of great ideas, but they do absolutely nothing to to make them into reality. So. Uh, I was one of the few philosophers from my year who actually wanted to do, to do something, and I think that I managed to uh, I managed to get uh, skills for for doing that, uh, studying new, uh, computational neuroscience for two years. And when you were a child in that small town, sorry, I still can't <laughs> okay, okay. the name. Um, yeah. Uh, all the way up to you, the time you were 19, was there a lot of uh, support for the things that you wanted to learn? Maybe friends who wanted to do the same thing? Mm -hmm. mm, from my parents, I had support but not understanding. Uh, they didn't really understand what I was doing. It was very confusing to them, especially when I was uh, going further into philosophy and wondering about mind itself. Uh, I think spending too much time on the computer was was just a, a usual thing I heard in uh, in my home. Just uh, you are spending too much time. Cannot you use it for half an hour a day? Doctor said half an hour is healthy, not more. Uh, and as uh, as for the colleagues, uh, I. I didn't have any colleagues at, or friends at school who would be interested in that. We had some kind of uh, philosophy club, but uh, I was one of the few dwelling in the uh, philosophy of mind. Uh, but I started uh, uh, looking for people online and I actually found a few people who were uh, very interested uh, in, in the matter. Uh, and knew them for several uh, years online, but I met them only after I turned, uh, I turned 19 or 12 or 20, uh, because just uh, logistical problems and we were living in completely different uh, uh, parts of, of the country. Mm -hmm. And you only came uh, to... How did you come to know about this hackerspace thing, this idea mm -hmm. of the hackerspace? Uh, the idea of the hacker space, it, it, I may have heard about it before, but I didn't really know that there is one in Warsaw until I was uh, on the first year of uh, computational neuroscience. And then when I was thinking if there is any place in Warsaw I can do something related to open source, and yes, actually this was when uh, I was looking for uh, somebody to help me uh, work on the uh, local OpenBCI, meaning the framework, not the hardware. And uh, uh, actually, I remember that I marched into what's of hackerspace, being totally in awe of what is happening, on all the people doing all absolutely awesome things. And I, I thought that in order to get their attention, I have to show that I have something equally awesome. I am not 
that awesome, but I, I have something which has a lot of potential. And I started telling them about uh, OpenBCI uh, we worked on. And so several people were very interested in, in, uh, in the matter. Uh, it's, uh, the problem was I wasn't able to set up it on my own PC. Uh, it is troublesome uh, even now if you want to do it, but I think they updated some code on the uh, they updated some code on the GitHub, so I could try now. It's, it's just there is very little documentation for for everything. Uh, certainly far less than for Open M and E or uh, projects in different countries. Okay, which year? Which year was it that you you first um, found out about the hack space? Uh, now we have sixteen. I think it was twelve, uh, two thousand twelve. Two thousand twelve, and um, I understand that at the time, or at least uh, when the hackerspace first started, it wasn't a hackerspace, right? It was um, it was called Brahma. Uh, yes. <laughs> so basically, I'm not the best person to tell you the origin story of uh, what's of hackerspace because that should be one of the founders. Uh, but lots of hackerspace first began. I think I first went there uh, in thirteen, uh, but uh, it began probably in twelve. Okay, I'm not the one asking uh, to be asked for dates, exact dates. Uh, anyway, uh, it began as an idea between uh, some friends, uh, and there were people from very different backgrounds. So we had some anarchists, we had some open source. Uh, uh, a lot of us, we had somebody from uh, Polish Linux user group, we had some uh, uh, some guys from the university uh, and uh, they wanted to create some space like uh, hackerspace uh, but uh, the whole idea got traction only after uh, the Brahma lab got closed or at least uh, squeezed uh, from the technical university of Poland uh, because this was Okay, this is uh, overstatement by several uh, degrees of uh, magnitude, but uh, uh, this was, I think, the closest we had to Bell Labs in, in Poland. Just a lab at the university which had a lot of partnerships with different companies, which was actually working on real-life problems, solving them, and uh, uh, it wasn't creating that many white papers. It was creating mostly just uh, solutions for existing problems, and it was very valued by the business, but very little from, uh, from uh, by the uh, by the academia itself. So uh, at some point, uh, the university decided to uh, just break uh, all the contracts and to close all the partnerships, uh, and just re redirect Brahma back into uh, back into the usual normal university uh, activi uh, activity uh, so a lot of people were very disgruntled were very angry at that uh, and they decided to, uh, to create a hacker space as a place where they can do the things that they love and they want to uh, to spend time with uh, so uh, I think, yes, this was the time uh, when they uh, found, uh, founded uh, uh, Hackerspace officially and they found a, uh, found a place uh, in the Warsaw Institute of Teleradiology, I always mess that up. Uh, anyway, just next to the Warsaw uh, Faculty of Economics, of uh, University of Warsaw, which is different university than uh, than Warsaw University of Technology, uh, but uh, they don't like hackers uh, equally. So we had our basement. Uh, it was uh, at first it was very ugly, but uh, a lot of members put a lot of work into it, so it uh, it became uh, okay place to work. Uh, uh, and uh, it was populated mostly uh, from 6 p.m. till till midnight. Uh, it usually held 
between six to 20 people. Uh, we had five rooms. Uh, the first room was the server room. Uh, the door to, actually you had to go through the server room to get to all the others, not the most secure idea, but uh, but uh, it's, it suited as well for several years. Uh, we had uh, uh, member cards, so you could use just uh, your member card to get inside. Uh, the first room being server room, uh, the zero room being server room, the first room being uh, quiet lab. So this was the place you weren't supposed to talk unless everybody talked, which was usually. Uh, but uh, if you were noisy in that place, everybody uh, had the right to just uh, uh, get, you, uh, get you out of, uh, of the room. Uh, the second room was dedicated to 3D printers, it was quite small, but also held all the uh, hacker boxes, so boxes with our staff for uh, all the projects that we worked in. Uh, we had the third room, which was a social room, uh, with some kind of lunch uh, with, uh, with sofas and huge table that when I started cleaning it, it had over two millimeters of dirt all on it. it. It wasn't that color uh, at all. Uh, but, but well, uh, it had some kind of kitchen like uh, uh, kitchen like equipment, but uh, a kitchen hacker space is not always a good idea, especially when somebody at some point starts uh, eating the thermal paste. Uh, or different things, or starts putting uh, uh, Tabasco in their eyes, or it's not a good idea. <laughs> uh, and we had the fourth room, which was for heavy equipment. I think it was uh, the least used of the rooms because it you had to go outside of the part that we uh, rented, uh, get into another corridor, uh, and just. Uh, that was the uh, the uh, hardware room, uh, and all the hardware, meaning electronics, uh, was handled in the, in the first or second rooms. Uh, so we actually had some equipment to to create new PCB boards and the prototype things uh, on the on the side. Uh, and we had a lot of different people. We had some anarchists, uh, we had uh, uh, a few uh, social activists fighting for transparency, fighting for privacy for people, uh, fighting, uh, just giving a lot of talks, uh, writing angry mails. Uh, so for example, when the Polish uh, Minister of Defense said that we had to defend our country from hackers. Uh, uh, all Polish hacker spaces uh, sent out a letter uh, to uh, to the ministry saying that hey hackers are the guys who actually tweak with the technology and let you know when something is broken, uh, not the guys that you defend from. You defend uh, from uh, cyber warfare. You defend from crackers uh, and uh, from spy agencies. Uh, not by people who learn, uh, self-educate and uh, uh, and basically propagate knowledge. Uh, that resulted in actually a visit from uh, uh, from some military guys in the hacker space, uh, and also from what I remember, I wasn't there, but there was quite a shitstorm, like literal uh, shitstorm, because one of the pipes in the ceiling burst and. Uh, for some reason, the military guys weren't treating us seriously with, with a lot of shit going around. Hang on, hang on. <laughs> the military guys visited when there was a literal shitstorm. Yes. From pipes. Okay. Yes, this may happen several hours before, but the hackerspace wasn't smelling or looking nice. Uh, I so was there was just shit everywhere. Uh, <laughs> there was always shit everywhere, but this time it was like a lit literal. Oh dear. Okay, what, what happened? Uh, they, they didn't deem us a, a threat to society. <laughs> okay, did they ask any particular question? I wasn't there. You, have, you would have to ask somebody who actually was there, but uh, uh, for sure those two situations happened on the, on the same day and it was fun cleaning afterwards. <laughs> okay. When was this? When did this 
shitty incident happen? But we would have to check from the from the date on the mail, but I think it was 2014. Uh, wait, this is now it's 16. Mm -hmm. Now it's 16. It was late 14 or early 15. Late 14, probably. Um, I'm not good with with days from from my memory. Hmm, no problem. Okay, and then um, so this was around. I guess so. You were there in about 2012. That's the first 2000, time. Uh, 2013. 2013. That's cipher. Yes, I visited space 2013. I joined for good uh, on 14 and I was there uh, till 15 uh, when I decided to leave uh, because uh, the hackerspace wasn't going uh, the way I, I wanted it to. Uh, we had, uh, we always had uh, some member drift, people just going away, new people joining, uh, but uh, for some time it was all the activists drifting away and we were getting only people interesting, interested in doing uh, hardware stuff, doing software stuff, but uh, keeping to themselves. And uh, one of my uh, agendas was to actually open space uh, to, uh, to, to the outside, to let people know that uh, hackers exist, that self-education is an option, uh, and uh, to actually uh, in, to be to exist in the whole environment of uh, all different organizations. So we used to have uh, uh, we still have uh, a lot of uh, organizations promoting women in IT, uh, and I wanted to actually show them that there is a hacker space, and if you want to learn more, to learn. Uh, some uh, not only some uh, simple tutorial but if you want to work on your own projects uh, to get some help from robotics to uh, to basically find a community where you can uh, learn and, uh, and basically which which wouldn't be only from this hour to this hour but uh, which will be a community persistent uh, in time Hackerspace would be a good place. If you are a PhD student and you think that uh, your, uh, uh, all, the, all the programs, all the applications that you write for your PhD are valuable, uh, I wanted uh, uh, that kind of PhD students to be able to come and say, hey, I have something which I think is valuable. Can you help me open source it? Can you help me Point, what do I have to do? Do I have to write tests? Do I have to write documentation? Where should I put it? How should I adver advertise it? Uh, and I wanted to, to just open it and not all of the members liked it. So at this point uh, when I was starting doing that, uh, still having a day job, uh, at this point uh, university, the Warsaw University Faculty of Economics decided that uh, uh, took over our building due to some uh, uh, due to some very old garages and who owned which building and they decided that they don't want uh, lousy hackers inside. Okay, I do have to say we are grateful because they gave us a lot of uh, uh, notice time but uh, they preferred to create an archive. So somebody had to uh, somebody had to uh, find a place for the new hub space, and uh, nobody was was able to do it. Not working full time for the hacker space. Somebody had to actually uh, be able to travel uh, between eight uh, a.m. and uh, four p.m. and visit places to check them. And I volunteered. I decided that this is something I want to participate. Uh, this is something I want to do in my life, and I can afford spending several months without a uh, day job. So I uh, uh, I quit my job. I became a, a Hackerspace board member, and I started looking for uh, for a new uh, space for the Hackerspace. Uh, 
we uh, we managed to find something. Uh, we managed to actually find a place uh, to to move there, and we we closed that uh, quite quite nice. There, there weren't any legal problems or any technical problems. Uh, from what I know, all the equipment survived. Uh, but that was some kind of uh, important marker in the history because uh, I was uh, I was considering moving to a new place uh, as an occasion for actually opening more to the people. Uh, again, we were just next to the subway station, so we were able to uh, to talk uh, to just organize some open not only. Uh, uh, open crypto parties we, we used to have, but we could really uh, try creating a bio lab. We had more space. Uh, we could try a lot of things, and I was sadly alone, alone in this because uh, most members wanted to to just focus on their interests, and they saw no point in in getting people from from outside. Uh, so. Uh, uh, they focused on creating a good hardware room, better in the, the better than in the uh, first hacker space. Uh, they focused on 3D printers, on servers, on infrastructure that they used, and not something that they should uh, work with as a uh, as a community. They considered hacker space more the, more a club than a community or a non governmental organization. And uh, we, we started, the conflict uh, got more and more open, uh, it escalated and at some point uh, I was, at some point uh, I was very persistent that we should open, uh, I was in conflict uh, with some other board members, I was asked to step down and I understood that this is not the kind of organization that I can take over and change everybody's mind. If they want to have a club, okay, uh, it's it's sad for me because I still feel that we are lacking that kind of uh, open hacker space in Warsaw. But right now I am not able to actually, uh, I am not able to actually uh, uh, found anything else. Uh, I know that uh, this would be a very different uh, space. Uh, this would be a space with, uh, without most of the people from Hacker Space. I wouldn't want to take the old members. This would have very different profile and just community building, funding, finding place, uh, taking time for everything. Uh, not for the next several years. So Hacker Space is a club and stays a club. Uh, I accept that. Uh, it's just not a place I can honestly suggest if somebody wants to, to open uh, uh, what they have or uh, that they can visit if they want, uh, if they don't have a very specific uh, do-it-yourself uh, mindset. Uh, 